to the YouTube. Uh, is it uh, is it YouTube or? Yeah, the link to the YouTube. We need the link to the YouTube. Yeah, of <laughs> course. I, I can post it. I can post it. But I think we are meanwhile already uh, live. So hello, everybody. It's great to have you there. And yeah, we will have two amazing speakers today, namely uh, Lamis and Mikey. And both will talk about performance. Uh, Lamis will talk about performance on the server side, and Mikey will talk about performance on the client side with Angular and with very nice experiments regarding, you know, Angular and change detection, as I've got it. So welcome, both of you. How are you? Pretty good, thanks. Hi. Okay. Cool. So I would say let's start with Mikey. I will put your screen on and yeah, let's go. Okay, uh, let's go, let's go. Let me have a sip of water first. Can you see my screen okay? Everything I is guess fine. This is, is a yes, Everything perfect. Is fine. Amazing. So let's start and welcome to the session fully zoneless high performance rendering in post IV. And I have to admit something front off. It's not zoneless. It is zone agnostic. What does it mean? It, it means we don't really care if your app is running with zone.js or without. We will bring the same performance or the same impact to your application. So you can really don't care about the whole topic zone, zone.js and so on. Uh, but let me give you some, some overview how this is possible and what is involved. I will skip some of the sections in this presentation here. This is really a complete one. But what I will pick here is um, a little bit of design documents that I read uh, based on all that studies. Rendering, some overviews, how Angular will render stuff, and then uh, structural directives that we are working on namely rx if rx switch rx let the stuff that uh, i shipped at the beginning of the year okay um, let's start with a design document a design document called change detection mental model in iv it is uh, created by mishko and there are a uh, several interesting sections you don't need to read all that stuff i just want to point out that there is a mark 30 method that includes scheduling. We got a new structure um, of all our components, building blocks and templates here in Ivy. And those are namely called L container, L view and embedded views that we already know. And with all those changes, we have possibilities in Angular elements regarding change detection. So this benefits will not only affect Angular elements, but also will have a significant performance impact uh, if we can leverage those new technologies. Uh, and of course, there is something very interesting. This is a stepping stone, uh, it's written in the documentation, a stepping stone for explicit state management, or how I called it in my research 2019, component state management. My name is Michael Latke. I'm a trainer and consultant run workshops. And in recent times, I specifically focus on performance. So if you are running any front-end application app, I'm, I'm pretty sure I can help out with some performance audits. Uh, but first, let's quickly jump over the past work, what I did with Reactive Component State 2019. So I basically uh, went through the problems of, of like scaling data flow in applications. And I went from a very confused setup of data flow to, to integrate something where we can organize it. And then I took those, those concepts that I introduced one step further and made it more performant. And the library here is called um, RX Angular State. I solved a couple of problems. I will quickly jump over this because uh, it's a 
really complete um, presentation and I will directly jump to the outcome. The outcome rx angular slash state is the library that you can download. I published it 2019 and it focuses or it was one of the first uh, angular libraries that focused on component state in a reactive way. In a way how you could connect uh, other observables and get rid of several nasty things like subscription handling or imperative um, problems like race conditions and so on. Um, I created a very slim um, service that let you connect and select pieces of state that you manage within a component. And I can also set and get values. And if you look at that, these are two paradigms. This is the reactive paradigm of working with streams, push-based uh, values, and the imperative paradigm where you have setters and getters. And this is a very good way of gluing those two paradigms together because not everything in Angular is prepared for a fully reactive thing. So we need those tricks to have a, a very nice and smooth uh, glue up. The typing is also very intuitive. We have just a state and then we have partials of this state that we can receive. Um, there are a couple of overloads how you can select and get the state, but the outcome should be you can organize. Um, this is a very minimal example of just having one observable in uh, in the template with, a, with an async pipe and the library basically abstracts away all the like uh, repetitive stuff from your template and from your code base. So it's a visual outcome of when you use it in the most minimal way. Of course, you can take it always one step further. Um, if you're interested, you should check out our docs. Mm, I believe this link is broken. So maybe I should switch and you should just Google Rx Angular slash state. Um, so far, so good. This was uh, my research and um, now you get a clue why uh, I started with state management first um, two, two years ago because it is fundamental for all those changes that you have to introduce explicitly. Because if you are zone less or you don't care about zone, you need to be very explicit on what should happen. So let's take a look about rendering and how we can understand rendering at the moment. So what, what Angular is doing at the moment and how we could introduce some changes in this rendering process uh, to understand it. The punchline of all these slides here is the async pipe is boring. And with the next couple of uh, informations, um, I will, or, or slides basically, I will basically try to convince you uh, to believe me that the async pipe is boring. So let's start with Angular template rendering or how I say, how to render the component tree. So what is a component tree? This is a mockup, mockup of a very simple site. At the very top, we have a service, non-visible stuff in blue, the application reference, and then we have our application component, a site menu, visible items, and so on and so forth. And this is the visible stuff in green, the component structure. And if we turn this component structure in uh, a linked tree, we see that it can or could look like that. And Angular, when initialized, triggers application ref tick. Mm. And if Angular triggers this application ref tick, our component tree is rendered from top to bottom and we render the app component and its children and its children and in turn its children until we are at the leaves of this tree, the very end. So this is uh, the first time very okay, I would say, but if you do that every time when you introduce a change, this is not really good. So Angular came up with something that is called change detection on push. And if you introduce change detection on push, uh, it detects the difference between the previous and the um, current assigned value to a binding of this component. And this difference I marked with a small delta sign, with a small triangle. And if we render our application and we arrive to this very component with the light gray delta, 
we apply the check and we see if the previous value is different from the current one. And in this case, it is not. So it turns into an, let's say, a don't check me state and Angular can go on and render the rest of the application. So change detection on push basically introduces the concept of immutability to your data flow. And this helps to distinguish and to detect changes on a component level. So the idea is basically, or let's say the propagated solution, use the async pipe and on push everywhere and you're good to go. Um, let's take a look at a real life example. If we would introduce a change to this very component here in a real application, you would also re-render those components. Why? Because it's a real application and you may end up even with linting rules that you have to maintain a component without change detection on push just to have your app working. This is a common scenario out there. And even if you are perfect, you could end up with third party libraries. And even if this is not the case, because you write all your code on your own and perfect, you will still uh, re-render from the inf affected component up to the top, the whole path is dirty, and then traverse it down and propagate the change to this um, pink container here, to this pink component. And this is unnecessary work that you do. And if you think about it, this is a real problem because every single method or impure pipe that you bound to the components template will get re-evaluated. Every single property, object property that you bind into your template will get checked again. And this is work that could have a very, very meaningful bad impact to your application. So how to fix that rendering problem? I would say before we fix it, we prove it. And I open a small demo application here where I display a component tree, a component tree with a like container component with, with, with holds another nested structure of a container component with change detection on default, another child with default, a sibling with on push, and in the default child, it is a sub child with on push, and in the on push child is a sub child with on default. So a mixed component structure with different change detection strategies. And the buttons here uh, reflect a way how we can run a specific way of, of like rendering mechanism or change detection mechanism in Angular. And one of them, a very often used, is mark for check. Mark for check is used within the async pipe and also within other commonly used things that Angular provides. And if I call mark for check at, let's say, the very leaf here, and I click it, uh, let me turn on the ripple so that you can see flashing lights, what is happening here. And if I turn on the ripple, you see all those components will get re-evaluated, like all their template expressions will get re-evaluated. And this is a lot of work. So this is a downside, especially <laughs> if you look at another implementation, the first one was really statically nested component structures. This tree is looks the same visually, but is not nested, but is using a technique called projecting of templates in Angular. And if I do this here, it is even worse. You see that we render way more uh, than we could render in the static one. So there is uh, for sure this problem of over rendering. And this is what I, want, what I wanted to point out with this demo. As we don't have endless time, let's start uh, to solve this problem. And we did uh, a lot of researches. We also tried out a lot of stuff in, in bigger uh, projects that are running in production. And all of those researches are basically condensed together in a version um, of code that we call rxangular slash template. This is like the library that targets the rendering problems. At the moment, it's a better version. And since three months, we're refactoring everything to the next release. And this release will, will really have a incredible big impact, uh, impact in your uh, way how you code in an ergonomic coding and also in a more performant rendering. 
Uh, let's start to introduce some of our first uh, two things, the push pipe and the RxLED directive. This is a pipe, the, the push pipe is an angular pipe. It is from, from its usage identical to the async pipe, so you don't need to understand any new concept or anything new. You just use it uh, as a replacement, as a drop-in replacement for your async pipe. And then we have a, a structural directive, RxLet, and this is a structural directive that enables you to bind the value or like the changing values of an observable to a local variable in your template. In this case, I named it O for observable output, and then I could render it. And those two fundamental pieces, very easy to use, very easy to understand, are like the essence that I want to start with to introduce you to. And I can switch here to a demo where I want to talk about the RxIf hack. Uh, what is the RxIf hack? So let me quickly uh, demonstrate the RxIf hack here in code. Um, yeah. So what a lot of people do is um, they use a way a small trick to bind the value of an observable to our template. And the trick looks like this. They assign an ng-if operator and then they bind an observable value over the async pipe and the s syntax to a variable name. Here in this case, it is named value. And then they can use this value inside of this template snippet. However, this has several drawbacks. The first drawback is that you um, cannot really work with bullish values because this ng-if will display and hide the template snippet. And the second one is it will use uh, the, it will use the async pipe and it will also re-render the full components tree. And if I can demonstrate this quickly, um, and I click here and click the next button, um, we see we have a value. Also, our ng-if has a value, but if I turn on the ripple and we, we look at the application container, like the most upper uh, place we can re-render or start to re-evaluate, we see we go up and down uh, all the time and re-render this application. If we would uh, switch to an implementation like uh, the rxif hack and push, the push pipe, and I will do that here now, we could um, get rid of the first problem. And if I turn on the ripple again, we can see that we now only re-render the very component here in this green box. So every green box is a component. But we still have the problem of displaying and hiding the stuff and cannot really be uh, render, cannot really render a template all the time. So what we can do to solve this problem is we can introduce the RxLet directive. And if you remember our RxIf hack from before, it basically was uh, only this snippet here uh, with replaced with an ng-if, and we had a s instead of a let, but the rest is really similar. And if you look at this snippet here, this is how you can replace your ng-if hack with our rxlet directive and bind the variable of a value to your template. So let's quickly check it out and let's see if we still have this flickering behavior where we are only able to see truthy values. And I click it the first time and this is the first time it renders the template. This is also something that is different. Our templates are lazy. Uh, and then I can see positive and negative values, or let's say truthy and falsy values. And if you take a look on the number of flashing values, another difference that you can see here is if I click the button and the random value is again false, I will not re-evaluate the template. So I distinguish between those values and only different values get re-rendered. 
This is um, the first thing that you can do, but you can take it one step further. You can say, as I now have the concept of laziness in Angular, and this is basically the first time we can really leverage the concept of lazy rendering in our templates, we could also do something with that. And if you think about it, so what is the context of, of an observable, for example, of something that changes over time? You have next values, we have, could have errors or completions of those processes over time, but you could also end up with another state, a state where you hand over the new thing that will give you a value in the future, but there is no value yet. And this is what we call the suspense state. Like it is assigned, but did not uh, provide any value so far. And we can also leverage like a template for that state. So basically, we could leverage templates for all those states, but I really want to start with one first so don't be overwhelming with information. So here I placed a small snippet, a small loading spinner icon, a ghost element, and this ghost element should, should get rendered as long as there is no first emission. So we can maintain this loading state here. And if I restart and I switch to my uh, example here, we have this small uh, circle that is a symbol for a loading spinner. And as long as no value is emitted, I can have this loading spinner. And when I change, I can have the real value and the changes in the template. So this reduces the complexity of your template a lot because you don't have to wrap a lot of if conditions and so on and so forth. We can take this one step further. We can apply all the different templates here. And I quickly copy paste the other snippets. So a loading spinner, an error icon, and a complete icon. And go on. We can see loading spinner, next values, and boom, an error icon. Or if I reset the thing back to the loading spinner, I could have next values and then a completion of the process and a complete icon. This is pretty cool, and this is what uh, we provide at the moment to give you a sneak peek about what we are able to do in the future. We not only have those loading spinners displayed here as initial values, we also will ship template, um, template triggers where you could have next values. And when you start to search again, you can give a signal and you can jump back to the loading state while the stream is ongoing. And then you can receive new values and go back uh, to your rendering state. So this is especially useful for everything that you want to do, well, like search requests, type aheads, or all that stuff will get reduced to a single snippet into your template. This is what we are planning to ship next year. Um, let's go back to the slides as we are already a couple of minutes in and we don't have infinite time here. And I want to talk about rendering strategies. So how did we implement it that we can only render this very specific component and not everything else? So uh, we use strategies and you can also configure your strategies by just passing a string to your pipe or to your let directive. But by default, there is one specific strategy assigned, the local strategy. And to explain to you the local strategy, I have to start with the global strategy first. So global strategy is, um, you can think of the global strategy as something like mark for check or as the new Ivy method, mark dirty. The difference between uh, those two is that mark for check relies on zone.js to initialize the next re-rendering of Angular. Mark dirty does not and does it without zone. So this is a very cool uh, thing. And um, we use those theta mark dirty methods. And if we do that and we introduce a change to one specific component, we go up the tree until the root component and mark all those components for check. And then Angular kicks in, runs change detection on all those components that are affected and re-evaluates all their template methods. And then it re-renders also all other children. If you remember, even if it runs without zone, this is a little bit too much because 
Doing that in a leaf component will pass a lot of other components that maintain tables, a lot of template syntax, and so on. And it has a, a, a like impact that you will feel if you don't go that path. So what can we do? Um, we can, or let me first demo quickly that we really traverse also with mark for check the full component tree. I go back to this nested structure and here I have a button mark dirty. And if I click it and I turn on the ripple and if I click mark, um, mark for check, you will see that this is happening. And if I click mark dirty, you will also see that the identical process in terms of re-rendering is happening, just disconnected from zone.js as initializer. Okay, as we understand that dirty marked, um, Mark Teta Mark Dirty is not really bringing that big of a benefit, even if it does good, a good job for getting rid of zone, we can think about another concept. We can think about explicit change detection, not explicit state management, but explicit change detection. And we call those explicit change detection the local strategy and we leverage under the hood a method that is called detect changes. So detect changes is also shipped as a heavy method tether detect changes. And what it does is if I introduce a change to this very component, it only and really only re-renders this component, re-evaluates this component and all its children. And if there is an effect, it will introduce it. So um, this uh, very specific two things, the LED directive and the push pipe, I introduced to NGRX at the beginning of this year. And my, my implementation there, basically it's called the component package in NGRX, ships a pipe that is called also called push, uh, just NGRX push, which is the identical implementation that we can see here. It was like the first try where I pointed out several problems that you will run into when introducing explicit local um, change detection. Mm. And this is over rendering. So the problem that you will run into is massive over rendering. If you introduce just detect changes into your re-rendering process, you will, instead of re-render your stuff one time in this very simple example here, 12 times. We use multiple push pipes somewhere in the component, right? Multiple LED directives. We maybe have different changes at the same time. This is a very common scenario. And this is like the smallest possible uh, use case that, uh, that I can figure it out to measure. Uh, you have 12 re-renderings and a blocking user interface. And this is like way slower than normal Angular. So nothing that we want to ship, right? So what we did in Rx Angular, the um, performance implementation of all those concepts is we introduced two techniques, scheduling and coalescing on component level. And what is scheduling? Let me quickly introduce something to you. You have scripting uh, stuff that runs code, uh, JavaScript in your browser. And in the end, then you will want to render something. And the difference here, the naive difference is Scripting stuff is something that is yellowish, greenish, and the purple stuff is rendering, and the green stuff is painting. Another difference, how you can display stuff to your, like the pixels on your screen, how you can display the pixels on your screen. And uh, I don't want to go too much in detail on the rendering process. I just want to point out that there is a specific point, and this is before the browser paints. And this point is one of the interesting points in uh, the whole browser event loop. So what is scheduling? You have, for example, an event, a click event, and this click event has a trigger logic. And this trigger logic triggers some work. In my case, I called my work XXXXX so that I can spot it easily in my flame charts. Um, so now we know what an event is, a trigger is, work is, so what is scheduling a task? Scheduling a task is I have an event that triggers some logic. And this trigger schedules, uses a scheduling method and execution context, for example, the animation frame, to ship the execution of a specific piece of work to over the animation frame, which ends up in another event right before your paint, and then executes your work there. This is 
the fundamental idea of scheduling. And with that in mind, and I know it is a very rough uh, and naive ex explanation, but I guess you can get the point. With this technique, uh, we can think about all the different methods that are available to schedule a task in the browser. And there is a variety. I cannot go into detail with all of them. Uh, I just wanted to know, uh, let you know that there are a variety of things that you can do with this technique. And we use this specific scheduling technique to, to implement one thing, coalescing. Coalescing is a concept that is already present in Angular. For example, there is a zone configuration method that is called ng, uh, um, ng zone event coalescing, and it helps to reduce the number of re-renderings of your application. So, if you think about all those different scheduling methods, there is one specific one that is called microtask. A microtask is, in my vocabulary, called nearly synchronous code. Why? Because it is not synchronous code. It will happen after the synchronous code, but immediately after the synchronous code. So it is nearly synchronous. A very small time span between scheduling the microtask and uh, like executing the micro task. And this very small time frame we use to basically measure the number of rendered um, attempts to our application. And then we say, OK, we have a lot of render attempts. And we forward all of those render attempts to this very specific method that records all the attempts in between the synchronous code and the micro task. And at the end, when the micro task kicks in, we say, OK, all those attempts to render our template that would run synchronously are now buffered, coalesced together to one single attempt to re-render the template. And this is like an essential trick that we need needed or everybody will need to use or to implement to get performant uh, local explicit change detection. It looks like this. We fire a rendering three times. We forward it to this uh, coalescing method, and then we do it only one time in your browser. Let's quickly have a look how this uh, whole concept plays off. Um, I go to the uh, very naive implementation of, um, no, I first show how Angular natively would do that. Uh, and I click the button and introduce changes. And we see from the very top to all our components in the application until this very component. So then let me introduce the first version on how you could introduce this um, local change detection. And in the NGRX component package that I in, uh, wrote, uh, I integrated that um, only if your application runs outside of zone. So very hard to test there because you cannot just switch off zone in your application. But here in the RX Angular version, I implemented it a little bit smarter. And now I can demonstrate all the different versions independent of your application running in zone or not. So if I click it and you watch the numbers, the very naive implementation will produce 45 checks. Now I click again, 54, 36, 33, 72, 81. So nine changes and a blocking screen. If I introduce coalescing to this whole process and I do it, I go down from nine to three, if you can read the number here, always three checks. And we did something else. We went one step further and we scoped the coalescing on, on this very component. Um, and now we get exactly one re-rendering. So this is the trick and the proof how our implementations uh, impact performance in Angular. This helped us to ship a lot of strategies um, in a way, how we went down from 12 re-rendering and blocking UI to one re-rendering and non-blocking UI. And this is really amazing. Let me sum up. We reduce the number of rendered components in the component tree. So we only focus on this very component and it maybe will affect other children's, but from this very root on, we reduced the number of renders or of dirty checks in your component, like the stuff that takes time from 12 to four, and in our current shipped version that you can download at the moment from NPM, one single rendering. And we also use scheduling techniques to ship the changes that you want to introduce at the right moment 
in your event loop. So don't you don't need to care about that on your own. We also provided a couple of other tricks. And I will uh, don't break too much here because we have a lot of cool demos and only limited time. Um, let me demonstrate what we can do. So to introduce unpatched APIs, I want you to remember that if you use <clears throat> a click binding on a button, if you use a click binding on a button and execute nothing in its callback, maybe a console log or meaningless code, right? You will initiate a re-rendering of your application. You will re-render the full application because you dirty, you dirty mark the components from the very place your button was located up to the tree and down. Why? Because your button, for example, uses the add event listener method and this add event listener method is patched by zone. So we came up with different strategies and different levels of how you can unpatch your patched APIs. And one of those methods is unpatch a directive that we shipped. And this is what Angular will do natively if you click one single button in a Hello World application that only contains one single button. If you run that code outside Angular, you go down to, I guess, more than a fifth of the full work that you would need to do. And what we did, we took it one step further. And with our implementation, you now only execute vanilla JavaScript. No zone involvement and also an essential trick to go zone agnostic. Because zone agnostic, to just to remember, means you don't care if your application runs inside of zone or not. You just use the tools and you have the wanted effect. The wanted effect in this case is incredible performant changes and interaction. I have another cool thing. I have the viewport priority for you. So you now know we have structural directives that reduce the size of your templates drastically. We have the Rx Angular state management library that is basically used in all these demos to make the code very slim and very, very ergonomic. And we now started to uh, ship some optimization tools. And one of the areas of, of, of web development and, and, and like optimization is that you could do something that is called under the fold optimization. Under the fold optimization basically means that, like if you think about a newspaper, a newspaper sells uh, by, the, by its fold. So the, the cover image and so on is like essential to sell your newspaper. And then you open it and then you get all the rest of the information, right? <laughs> Same with your app. So the stuff that you see is above the fold, is super meaningful to the user and should take a, the smallest amount of time to get rendered. Stuff that is above the fold, you should not care that much, right? In the in a performance perspective. So you should, in best case, do nothing to the pieces and, 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 uh, of code of, of like template above the fold. So if I click this auto button, I introduce changes to my application because I interact with the page, I have live updates or so on. And if I move this specific component here above the fold by scrolling it out, you should watch the change detections or the dirty checks that are running in this very component here when I scroll it out. So they stop. And I scroll it in again and they start again. So what I do here is I decouple these elements from the normal way of running the change detection by just applying a different strategy. You already know global and local strategy and guess what? We have a noob strategy, a noob strategy that does nothing. And I just apply the noob strategy when this component exits the page. So pretty cool tools that you can use to optimize all your different things. Um, if you have other cool ideas, feel free to ping us, open an issue. We will definitely implement that stuff. Okay, um, let's see what else. Um, I want to introduce as a last thing before I close up the whole session, 
the stuff that we will ship next year, because I'm super excited about that. I already introduced you to Pushpipe and LED Directive, and there are other structural directives, obviously, out there. Rx if Rx switch and Rx4 is something you should know from the Angular common package, ng if, ng switch, ng4, just in a reactive and ultra performant way, and then some other cool ideas and tricks that we um, want to try out to get more ergonomic templates. Um, so what is the big change that we want to introduce next year? Think about the component tree, right? This is uh, what we so far understand, application reference, a lot of components. And if you take a closer look on one of those components and you zoom in, you have L container and L view. What are those things? Those things are like new um, template snippets, how Ivy is interpreting and like the uh, um, holding all the snippets of your component to display them, all the HTML parts, everything that is involved. And if you zoom in to one of those components, you will see that this is not only a component tree, but there is also another smaller tree inside of the component that consists out of embedded views, L container, L view, and all those new things. And now imagine you could focus your change detection not only on component level, but you can go one level deeper to embedded view level. And then you only render the snippet of template you really need. And I want to demonstrate to you that we are at the moment able to do that and that we are fiddling around how to ship that change without breaking the current API that we have published already. Mm. So here we see, if you look at the very top, um, if I click the button uh, and I run focus the change detection on this very component, this is what will get dirty checked at least, or executed, or re-rendered, right? If you think about embedded view level, so this here is a snippet that is placed inside of an embedded view, and I go with our new idea, I would go down another layer in this tree structure and only render only the specific component that introduces the change. And we did some demos, of course. We demoed the Rx4, uh, Rx if in a proof of concept and introduced also other things like template caching and so on. The Rx uh, switch directive, where we can basically switch values without triggering a re-render of all of those things. And we can also go to our current most favorite uh, uh, feature, our baby, uh, the Rx4. And what I do here is I create a table. And don't worry, uh, I have a look at the time. This is the last demo that I will run um, to, to demonstrate Rx4 and, and rendering. So this table here has 10 rows and uh, five children, or five columns. And if I click this button, let me turn on the uh, turn off the ripple because it takes additional performance. And if I record and I introduce constantly changes to this uh, table structure, and this is a very small table, right? 10 rows and 10 children is not a lot. Uh, and I run these changes as fast as possible and measure it, you see the outcome. And then I switch to our first very bare bone implementation of the RX4. And then I run this measurement again, and I automatically introduce all those changes to our table for a while and record how fast it is and how much time it takes to do those changes. And in these records, I can compare the outcome. So what I want to do is I want you to <laughs> take a look at this flame chart. Uh, and count the number of red dots that you can see in this very bar here. So not a single frame drop. Not a single frame drop in this very outcome. And now let's go back and see what Angular is doing natively. I hope you can see the comparison view here. If not, um, I can have a good picture later on uh, to demonstrate that. Let's switch to Angular native way. And I guess you can see the difference. This is every single rendering, a frame drop. And there is one more thing. We can do, I guess, twice as much renderings in the same time as Angular would do. 
and we will not have a single frame drop. This is uh, one of the really excited things. And uh, this is also displayed here in a comparison view. This is what we want to ship. As you can see, this is an old screenshot that has some frame drops included. We also got rid of that one. We got rid of that small things that are still bad in this screenshot by introducing main thread scheduling, or how you would call it post task scheduling, or in React, they call it React concurrent mode. And we basically ported that mode to your um, native Angular code now. So the last demo is to demonstrate that we are able to schedule a bunch of tasks on your main thread with a specific priority. And I will open up an image here. And this image has colors. And colors have a meaning for a user, right? If I see black colors first in this uh, graphic here, I would be able to spot uh, the image very fast because over the, the textures, I can, I can really catch uh, in uh, very fast how, what it is. Transparent colors don't mean a lot to me as a like person that sees this picture because I, it's anyway transparent. And then dark and light colors have a different priority from dark to light. So the whole idea about main thread scheduling is displaying the important stuff to the user as fast as possible and then the not so important stuff and having this scheduled on an efficient and performant way on the main thread. What I will do is I will turn every single pixel of this image into a component and assign a priority to it. And then I will click this component. Let me uh, scale up the pixel size a little bit and let me show you that this uh, is really a component structure and not just a, a red box. I have um, 3,884 components visible that you can see here as boxes, as separate DOM elements. And if I click this repaint button, you will first see the black colors, then you will see um, all the dark colors, and then you will see that I re-rendered the transparent colors. While streaming, the browser is under heavy load, but you can still see that it happens after another. And the cool part, I can interrupt, as you can see, I click the button while the process is ongoing and interrupt those rendering priorities while they are running. And this is like an ultimate proof, main thread scheduling implemented in Angular, non-blocking rendering on the main thread. This is how I want to close the whole presentation. And I want to say thanks. I want to say thanks to all the contributors to RX Angular. If you want to also cheer them up, give us a star, hit on GitHub, hit the star button and cheer us up. Also check out the libraries RX Angular template and RX Angular state, which is used in all of those demos to have explicit state management in a very ergonomic way. And that's it. Uh, remember, I'm a trainer and consultant. You can book me and I'm very interested to run some performance audits on your slow applications. So thanks for your time. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks, Mikey, for this pretty nice overview. So before we proceed with the uh, next session, I have some general information for you. And don't forget, in the end, we will do a Q&A with our two awesome speakers. So just put your questions into the chat. So regarding uh, the information I have for you, one question I got is if I am the person here in the middle. And the answer is no. Uh, this is not a Yao photo of mine. So let me check. Yeah, you'll see everything. And then I want to talk to you about our sponsors because our sponsors make all of this possible. And so I want to give big thanks to Netconomy, a really great company in Graz using Angola in the front end. Meanwhile, they are a gold sponsor. Arena Tech, also a cool company in Styria. Uh, they are doing cool stuff in the area of auctions. And uh, my company is the organizer, uh, I also want to mention it. So by the way, if you want to speak at our meetup, please come to me, please let me know about your ideas. Also, if you want to become a sponsor, just reach out to me using 
email, for instance, or you can also find me on Twitter. By the way, I have a little tiny Christmas present for you. Some weeks ago, I've updated my ebook about Enterprise Angular. And now in the third edition, it covers module federation, which is quite a nice new technology for micro frontends. Besides, it still covers domain driven design and an X mono repos. You can get it for free. Uh, just go to this hyperlink angulararchitect.io slash book. Okay, cool. So let's proceed with the second speaker of today. It's Lamis, and Lamis Hello. is a freshly baked Angular GDE, is that right? Thank you. Yeah, recently. Cool. So I remember the first time I've seen you, it was in Spain, in Madrid, uh, at NG Spain. Last and year. Yeah, it was last year, yeah. And you did a really nice talk about Rx, and I think today you will talk about the other side of things about the uh, yeah. backend, is it right? Yeah, about an exciting technology, I believe it's uh, WebAssembly. Yeah. Nice. But I want to thank uh, before uh, I start Michael for his uh, awesome talk and awesome library. And I think it comes uh, in handy in many situations. Uh, I have a project which is uh, real time, which covers, I mean, real time updates in Angular. And I think I will give it a try. Nice. Uh, yeah, in order to improve the performance and reduce the render, si the render um, uh, times, I mean, in my application. Yeah. Sounds great. So perhaps you can yeah. come back in some weeks or months and tell us yeah. about the findings. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Cool. <laughs> Yeah. So I would say the stage is yours. And thank you. Do you see my slides? Yeah, yeah, we see them. Perfect. Yeah. So hello everyone again and welcome to my talk, Boost Journal GS Server with WebAssembly. A little bit about myself before we start. My name is Lenise. I'm from Tunisia. I'm GD for Angular and leading an Angular team in my company. And aside, I'm the founder of Angular Tunisia. I'm involved in women empowerment communities, so uh, don't hesitate to reach out. And I'm a mentor, speaker, trainer, and a content creator. So let's jump into it. And my talk, as I said, is about an exciting technology, which is WebAssembly. And I think you probably already heard about WebAssembly, always shortened as WASM. It was announced in 2015, like five years ago. And what is it? Okay, so it's a low level binary format for the web. Okay, if you are familiar with Java, it's like uh, the bytecode uh, in Java, but it's something for the web okay and then uh, and when i say for the web it means that it will be executed in the browser so behind the scenes inside the javascript virtual machine and it's designed for efficient safety and speed okay uh th those are the most i mean um important uh advantages, if you want, of WebAssembly. It's even faster than JavaScript. And here, I don't want to give numbers, OK, because people say that, some people say that it's, I don't know, 15 times faster, 50 times faster. But uh, there is no, I mean, a general rule for this, OK? It really depends on the use case, OK? Sometimes you find that in some use cases, JavaScript is faster. But in general, keep in mind that WebAssembly shines in use cases where JavaScript can't, OK? So yeah, in general, let's say, is uh, faster than uh, JavaScript. And why is it faster? It's faster because it's um, optimized 
before it hits the browser, okay? While JavaScript is optimized while it's executed, okay? So when we write a JavaScript code and we pass it to the browser, this is was uh, th this is what happens behind the scenes, okay? They are, uh, there is a unit for uh, parsing uh, and a unit for uh, to interpret and to give the byte code or to produce the byte code and another unit for optimization okay so i break it down in three pieces but it's like without details but yeah there are units for optimization and parsing etc um, but web assembly uh, with web assembly i mean with web assembly format uh, those units will be skipped, okay, because it's already optimized, it's already low level, and it's byte code, okay, so it's in the machine uh, language, okay, so those, I mean, steps will not be performed, and this what explains uh, why JavaScript or WebAssembly is faster than JavaScript. And if you want to learn more about the uh, work of the JavaScript virtual machine, what happens behind the scenes, it's something very exciting. And I really encourage you to uh, check out the talk of Benedict Murr. He's a Googler. And um, you, I will share with you uh, my slides. You will find the, the link to the talk uh, later. And he explains, I mean, in many articles and in this particular uh, session in GS Camp, the uh, work, okay, uh, under the hood of JavaScript virtual machine. So I highly recommend uh, watching this in order to learn uh, what is happening behind the scenes, okay? Uh, well, so we said it's a low-level binary format. It's designed for speed, efficiency, and um, speed. Uh, it's efficient, safe, speed, and efficient. And it's not, okay, a, a replacement for JavaScript, okay? Bear in mind that both languages cooperate together. JavaScript in the high-level and WebAssembly in the low uh, level, okay? Uh, it was, um, WebAssembly was designed in order to work alongside with JavaScript. You can even call WebAssembly code from JavaScript. So, uh, yeah, it's not a replacement, okay? And what I want to, uh, I mean, emphasize this information because uh, when WebAssembly is the scenes, many, um, Many uh, developers are saying that, uh, yeah, it's the death of JavaScript, okay, no more JavaScript, but this is not true. I mean, okay, so both languages are meant to be together and to cooperate together. So bear in mind that WebAssembly, it's not a replacement for JavaScript. And it's now a standard, okay? For people who don't know, WebAssembly was announced to be the fourth language of uh, language of the web, okay, by the World Wide Web Consortium W3C last year, okay, December last year. So we have four languages for the web. Yeah, we have HTML, JavaScript, CSS, and WebAssembly, and it's even um, I mean supported. It has shipped in the four major browsers: Safari. Chrome, Firefox, and Internet Explorer. And it's useful in many use cases, uh, namely uh, gaming, transpilers, tools, data science, some, in, some use cases in data science, in some VR, e AR web applications, and in some AI use cases, okay? Uh, because in those, I mean, in those fields, I think that performance and speed is a mess. You don't have the choice. For example, in a gaming platform, latency, I mean, is not tolerated at all, okay? You will lose your clients. But uh, yeah, so in those use cases, uh, sometimes JavaScript does not shine. So you have here WebAssembly as the solution or the rescue for you, okay? And if you want to check uh, out the list of the exhaustive use cases, uh, you can just check out the 
official documentation under the use cases section, you will find the whole list of many amazing use cases of WebAssembly. And it's even in production now, okay? It has shipped in Unity like two years ago, okay? So I think you may all be familiar with the gaming platform Unity and yeah, from uh, I, th I think since 2018, like two years ago, they are using WebAssembly uh, in the last uh, in the latest versions, uh, Webpack also okay for uh, people. I mean, into the front end development, you may all be familiar with Webpack, and Webpack uses WebAssembly. Uh, the Google um, Earth version available in Firefox also uses WebAssembly, AutoCAD. Okay, which is very famous application written in C C was brought to the web thanks to WebAssembly. Okay, and uh, yeah, this was this was amazing because you can bring, I mean, like twenty years of experience into the web. You don't have to rewrite anything, but you just um, compile into WebAssembly. And I will tell you about compilation later on my slides. Uh, yeah, so AutoCAD now is available in the web using WebAssembly. Source map also use, uh, is using WebAssembly. Yeah, and many others. I just picked out the most famous ones. And uh, yeah, it's compiled from other languages. And this, the most, I think, amazing part of WebAssembly, okay? It's compiled from other languages they the community started by supporting three languages c c plus plus and rest and now there is many languages that you can start from and compile to web assembly namely go c sharp assembly script kotlin the d language pascal yeah i think those are the most i mean um, the, the supported languages and when I say compile, that yeah, there are, there are compilers that you can use in order to compile your application and to get this WebAssembly output that you can deploy uh, in the web later. Okay, and there is a specific compiler for every language. Okay, so for example, mscripten is the recommended compiler for C and C plus plus languages okay and um, okay if you want to check out or to notice which compiler I should use uh, look no further because in the documentation in the official documentation there is a list of uh, the all the supported languages and you can find links that you can follow in order to see how uh, to see the steps uh, that you should perform in order to compile your application uh, or um, this language into uh, WebAssembly. There is an incredible amount of information there. So, yeah, so check out the first thing, the official documentation. For example, for C, C++, you'll find that mscripten is the official or uh, recommended compiler to get the WebAssembly output. Okay, so this is the official documentation. There is an incredible amount of information there. Yeah, so just uh, check out, uh, check it out. And um, there are also online tools uh, available in the web. Um, there is WebAssembly Studio. I think it's an amazing open source uh, project because you can start to play immediately with WebAssembly. Okay, if you want to do, just go ahead, go to the cloud uh, WebAssembly.studio platform, and you can just create your C project and compile it, and there are many features there. So this is an amazing project. There is also Wasm Fiddle uh, that I discovered lately, uh, which is also on the cloud, and you can start playing with WebAssembly immediately. So. Uh, was on Fiddle, yes, also. And um, this is the output of Wasm. Okay, so this is the Wasm output, and it's binary. I mean, this is what, what it looks like. Okay, it's just binary. And at first, when I saw the output, I was like, what? I mean, yeah, it's not 
uh, it's not uh, destined to the uh, to human beings. Okay, <laughs> it's just a machine language. The machine will understand this output and will execute it. It's not our job, and hopefully there is a format for human being, which is the WebAssembly text format, and uh, always shortened as was it. And uh, yeah, it's uh, available, I mean, to just make it simpler dealing with WebAssembly. Yeah, there is a specific syntax, etc., but it looks like this. So this is the uh, output of a multi multiplying function, okay? It's just a simple example to go uh, with it. Yeah, and still it's not really clear at the beginning, but like any other language, you just have to learn the grammar, the syntax, etc., in order to, yeah, get into it, okay? So, uh, yeah, but still it's more, I mean, uh, it's simpler than the other format. That's obvious. Well, um, and there are um, tools in the WebAssembly um, official uh, GitHub uh, account uh, that uh, you can use in order to, uh, I mean, uh, transform the textual representation into the WASM representation, which is WASM output. So from what to WASM, you can do the opposite also from WASM to what you can even um, decompile it using the WASM decompile or just do, uh, the, co the conversion from WASM to JSON. There are many uh, computers and tools available in the WebAssembly binary toolkit okay that that are very useful and can comes in handy in many situations so just keep in mind that there is this toolkit yeah if you have one day i mean such a requirement okay and uh, it has shipped also in node.js starting from the version 12 uh, in the web assembly system interface was he available in the Node.js uh, server? Okay, so uh, yeah, and those were fantastic news for me because at that time um, I, I was delivering a talk about real time uh, real time components in Angular, and I was working with a Node.js backend, and I was struggling with performance. Okay. And why I was struggling with some with the performance of my application because I was um, doing many calculations, okay, and expensive operations, uh, which took so many time to get executed in JavaScript. Okay, I got some Fibonacci suit, etc., and uh, factorial in order to do some um, calculations to get result send them to the front end and make decision later, okay? Or just show them in order to make decision manually or something. But still, I need every time to do some calculation and send it to my front end layer. So uh, yeah, it took so much time and in real time topics, if you want, um, speed A is a must, okay? We can't tolerate latency because you're not real time anymore. Okay, so you should deliver data and uh, metrics, results, calculations, wherever you want, in time near to the real time. That's the the, the idea. Okay, yeah. So uh, performance was, I mean, a critical um, issue for me. Okay, so I said to myself, um, why not? using WASM in my Node.js server. It was designed for speed. It's faster than JavaScript in most cases. So let's give it a try. And the first question I ask myself is how to use WASM in Node.js. Obvious, right? And the step one uh, is to create 
your source file. I mean, if you want to, uh, if you if you have a, a source file, uh, I mean, the code written in any language, in any of in any one of the support languages. So here I picked this. Uh, this I mean this function multiply function to just show you a hello world example okay we need to learn how it works and then you will put more complicated things stuff in the application so the first basic example of the multiply function I wrote it in C and this is the output well I think fancy step two I should compile this file into a web assembly into a WASM module and how to do this I check out the official documentation and I saw that I have to use the M scripting compiler and there are two ways to to use it to use I mean to compile from C++ to WASM uh, well whether you uh, install it locally in your machine and you just execute this command or you just use it indirectly um in, in an online tool okay and you have the choice uh now step three we have this warzone module we will call it in the node.js server okay and how we call it so here is the basic code i mean three lines of code and you're done to call a warzone file inside your node.js server uh, i just read this file um, using the uh, file system node.js library which returns a buffer that I will um, wrap into a unit 8 array and pass it to the instantiate method of the WebAssembly API. So this is the WASI API available in uh, node.js. It's experimental, okay? It's still experimental in the version 12. And um, yeah, I, I just call this instantiate method and which will return all the exported uh, library as GS that I can call uh, later. Okay, I can call my methods later as, as if I am working in a JavaScript environment. Okay, yeah, and that's it. Okay, so this way I was able to just call my WASM file inside the Node.js server. Now let's talk performance, okay? What about performance, which is the heart of the talk? Well, um, so when we say performance, we should do some benchmark. So the first thing I, um, I put in place was a benchmark tool. I've used the uh, benchmark.js library available in NPM, and there are many other great packages. There is gsperf, uh, yeah, and there are many others. Um, you can even use the uh, Google Chrome uh, performance tool um, in many cases, okay? But uh, yeah, but I give this library, uh, but I've used this, this library, benchmark.js, and I did my first proof of concept still in the multiply function. Okay, so I have here the JavaScript implementation uh, in the left uh, side and in the right side, I have the WebAssembly and I measured the performance and how to measure the performance. You should just, uh, I mean, require the benchmark library and call the benchmark suit, which is the API responsible of measuring the performance. And here you put, a, it's an event-based library, okay? So uh, here I have the events. I mean, I just put the functions I want to measure, okay? Here I'm using, this is the first function, which calls the WASM module. This is the second function that calls the JavaScript module. And on complete, I just log which which i mean which function was faster uh okay so uh yeah and uh at the end you just hit run uh in order to uh, get those um function executed and those the metrics i found okay which is, what is good with the benchmark module is that uh it gives you how many time uh, this uh, this this function 
was able to get executed okay per second okay how many executions per seconds we can perform this function can perform and here it's the uh, i mean the error i mean uh, the, the margin of errors okay so uh, yeah and uh, as you can see here javascript is faster okay it's far faster from wasm and I think in my case, which is the multiply function, this is very normal, okay? Because as if you, it's it's um, it's like you are going to, I mean, crack a net using sledgehammer. Uh, yeah, it's it's uh, web assembly here. You are over engineering with it. I mean, yeah, it's not so. Uh, it's not the right use case because multiply is already fast in JavaScript. So. I am calling a module, allocating resources, just given a binary format, just to do multiply function. So, which is already fast, doesn't make sense. So, I said myself, I said to myself, okay. So, let's do the proof of concept number two, which is my use case in the real time, in my real time backend. So, in my real time backend, when I did a benchmark. I saw that uh, the functions or the methods that are consuming most of the time are the O2 to N functions, okay, which are basically, I was using factorial and Fibonacci, okay. So those functions were consuming so much time in JavaScript environment. Yeah, so I said to myself, I will externalize those functions in Wasm modules, and I will see, as Wasm, how this will work. And this is the first output of the factorial, okay? And both functions are recursive, and I use an infinite amount, I mean, I don't want infinite, but it's not, um, there's no range for the amount I give to the factorial in Fibonacci, okay? I don't know what the front end is calculating and sending to me. So I should, yeah, take those metrics in order to calculate the results. So, uh, yeah, this is what may, makes the um, complexity of, of, of those calls and of those processes. That's why they are expensive operations. Yeah, so I, I said this is the um, WASM output of the factorial. This is the WASM output of the Fibonacci. And here I am uh, just calling this WASM module inside my Node.js server, okay? Instead of calling the JavaScript plain function, I put it aside and I'm calling the WASM module. And here I am um, calling the um, JavaScript module and I'm logging as usual, which is faster. And as you can see here for the Fibonacci of 100, WASM is faster, is far faster, okay? WASM was able to do, look how many operations per second while JavaScript didn't perform any in one second, okay? This is Fibonacci of 100. And if you multiply, you will gain even more. And for the factorial 100, same thing. Wasm was two times faster than JavaScript, okay? And those were incredible news for me because I am just doing the bench for 100, okay? But I have an incredible amount of numbers, so the gain will be more and more significant. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I just uh, I just here I'm just pointing out my device specification because it, because it's very important when you are performing a benchmark. Just consider your device specification because it's not the same performance and the same results from one machine to another. But my machine is 16 gigabytes uh, RAM, a 64 bit operating system. I'm using Windows 10. Okay, uh, yeah, those are the specifications of my machines, and this is the final gain. I mean, I found myself that I gained 45 percent, and when using web assembly, and I performed this uh, with the metrics 
uh, I have and the, the I mean the numbers I have in my um, real time uh, Node.js server, but if the numbers will grow, the gain will be more significant. Okay, but at least I have 35% gain, and this was really awesome. Okay, and the idea, if I, I want to sum up the idea, the idea is okay, just externalize if you have some. Um, processes which are not fast in in your Node.js server, just externalize those processes in a WASM module and call the WASM module instead, because you will compile it to a binary. So when it will be executed in the JavaScript virtual machine, it will be very fast. So uh, yeah, just compile it into WASM, externalize this, this, uh, this process, and it will be awesome. Okay, the results will be awesome. But what wasn't really awesome was um, the debugging of WebAssembly. Okay, debugging web was WebAssembly was a little bit, I mean, tricky because okay, even if there is the textual representation, but still it's a little bit a nightmare. I don't know. It depends on the situation, but still, it's not this uh, enhanced. Okay, but people in the community are really working hard and they are delivering many, I mean, uh, features, okay, and there are many libraries and extensions, etc., that you can find on GitHub. And yeah, maybe this will be approved uh, and I think it will. Uh, yeah, but uh, the idea again here to work around this drawback or disadvantage if you want, when you externalize, just externalize something standard or uh, yeah, that you unit tested and you know that okay, it will work. Or when there is a bug or something, you can detect it easily. Okay, don't put many lines of code in many processes. In some was a module, you will not. Yeah, it will be very messy, and it, you will not notice the advantage of WebAssembly. Okay, just externalize in many was a modules, and yeah, just uh, separate the concerns, and you will be fine to go with it. Yeah, and if you want even to, um, I mean, uh, to get a cool experience, cooler experience if you want, uh, combine Rust with WebAssembly and you'll find uh, amazing results. I mean, here there is a book that I really recommend uh, reading, uh, Rust and WebAssembly. If you have this use case or you can use Rust and you combine it with WebAssembly, just go ahead and give it a try because it's really worth it. Yeah, and uh, that's it. Thank you uh, for your time and stay safe. And if you have any question, don't hesitate to reach out even later on Twitter. I can answer your questions. Thank you. I thank you, Lemis. That was really great. I really liked the benchmarking and the comparison. Yes. So thanks for that. Uh, I see Michael is gone for some reason, but I guess we need Michael for our okay. question. <laughs> Otherwise, I can uh, try to answer everything, but I don't have a clue about this. So most obviously, it would not be a good answer if I tried to answer his questions. So let me reach out to him. Okay. So, yeah, Mikey is back. Great. <laughs> I was here. <laughs> Good to have you back. <laughs> yeah. Cool. So, once again, thanks for your two awesome talks. I have several questions here. People were asking several things. For instance, uh, Markus Falk is wondering this here. I wonder how large the application has to be in order for on push to have a no disable impact. Are there any benchmarks? Yeah, so this is a very good question. Um, I would say um, because the push pipe is something that has a lot of limits. The push pipe is basically limited to the component um, context, let's say. Um, if I want to take this question one step further and I take all 
options that we ship with RX Angular, not only the push pad, but also the directives. The impact is um, uh, immediately measurable because um, you just need to have a table and a p tag on your <laughs> on your website that you want to render or display, and this is measurable at the initial rendering immediately and also in changes. So whenever um, your change is introduced on a leaf of the component, you will have the, the biggest uh, downside of, of all those impacts. And the more up your component is, uh, the lower this, this downside is. And uh, another um, metrics that you can use to measure is LM, like template expressions per component. And as you saw, uh, 10, 10 items and uh, five columns in a table is a, a very default table that you use in your applications, I believe. 10, 10 rows, five items is uh, normal. And I only render a true or false value. So this is the minimum you can display as a state in a table. And you saw the measurements, right? An update is like blocking every time and you really feel that. Every red dot in a flame chart means that user will notice the UX. So if your, if your application is bigger than 10 rows and five columns in one view, you will, you will have a use for it. Is this a, a good answer? I think so. I think so. So if you, Mark, if you, yeah, yeah. sorry to, to close it up, if you really want to see measures, there is another repository where we like everything that we implement or most of the performance things, we measure it and document it with flame charts and so on so that you can just go there, have a look at the HTML structure and at the charts, and then you can make up your, your opinion on your own. Thanks. Cool, great, great. So if you have further questions, Markus, feel free to reach out using the chat or using Twitter or something else. Snail mail, for instance. No, please don't use snail mail. So let me look down. Yeah, so I think this question is easy to answer. Uh, Markus from Bonn is asking if your example application is available somewhere on the internet. Yes, I can post the link. This is basically GitHub slash RX Angular. And then you go to the apps uh, demos page and you just surf it, NGXS for surf and then you're good to go and the, the stuff is running. Uh, I will post the link here in the comments. Uh, so watch out for it. Great, cool. Oh, Manfred, could you post it? Because I see I don't have uh, a post option. Oh, really? Okay, yeah. I send it in a private chat. Thanks a lot. Of course, I'll do. I, so, I think I will put it. Sorry, Lemis. I, I will put it if you want. Yeah, please. Great, thank you. So the next question is also from, I, I think, Marcus. Uh, when using Angular 10 and NGRX, also comes with a similar NGRX LED directive like RX LED, uh, how do they compare to each other? I really like the question because I implemented both of them. I implemented the NGRX component package and RX Angular itself. And um, the push, the, the the elements in NGRX component only bring benefit if you turn off zone completely in your application. And I'm on this topic since three years now, and I did not find a single application where you can switch off zone and something is working. <laughs> so I consider them as useless in, in the uh, manner of like performance. The useful thing that I see in this implementation that I did is the NGRX LED enables you to bind the uh, observable to a context, but there are no optimizations. It's also over rendering if you use it multiple times and so on. So if you look at the code base uh, since nine months or, or more, I only develop uh, NGR, uh, RX Angular, uh, and you can also see the changes there. And it is drastically. We can also measure it if you like. Um, I did not invest too much time to measure old products, but um, we can ship some measurements to compare them. It will be a drastical difference. Nice, awesome. So let me scroll down. Oh yeah, this is also a good one. 
Your brother in names, Mikey, is asking if there is something on the official roadmap for something like the stuff you presented. Yes, this is an amazing question. Um, so all my work is based on several design documents that the Angular team published for official um, access, I would say. And I tried to aim for an API that is nearly identical to the stuff that Angular will ship in the future. What, what will be the difference and why most of the stuff we implement will not be natively available? I can start with structural directives. It's a very fast answer. Um, there is one comment in, in the, there is an issue for, for something like the RxLet, um, open since years with uh, hundreds of sums up. And the outcome there, still the outcome there is that it will not be performant because we would have to implement that into the compiler. I did tests and implementation and measures, and I'm not just that opinion, but I guess this will not change. The, the, the outcome is they would have to implement it in the compiler. This would be a too big change. Um, therefore, like structural directives in the form I ship it will not be natively available. But let's talk about stuff that will be available natively. Mark30 is a, a Tether method, a hidden method um, in, in Ivy. Also detect changes, Manfred has also a very nice talk about uh, those uh, local change detection things in, in Ivy. And Mark30 will be the new change detection method, how you can run it locally, explicitly. And if you read the design documents, they considered a lot of things. They considered um, stuff that you will need when you go to explicitly introducing a change. This is a render callback. When is your page done with rendering the content uh, so that you could position the stuff as, as a final final adjustment. Um, how is the rendering scheduled? They have a flag that says schedule, scheduling technique. Um, I guess they also consider uh, main thread scheduling and prioritized scheduling because this will get shipped in, in Chrome pretty soon. Um, and those APIs, I believe, or those techniques will, will also get shipped in Angular natively. We wrapped them with strategies because we want you to implement way more customizable things than Angular will provide. And, and we will basically ensure that we can rely on Angular's new change detection system and give you the option to tweak it a little bit more to see what's really possible and how to like uh, stably introduce your ideas to your application. Nice vision, thank you. Um, so the next one is a quite specific one. If I have a component that has a host listener, for instance, on document click, so it listens on any click anywhere on the page, will every click mark it as 32? Okay, uh, if you have a component and you have a host listener, then this component is located somewhere in your component tree. And a host listener listens to clicks on a specific HTML element in the tree. So you will mark from this very component up to the top uh, all others as dirty. Yes, this is true. And uh, for, for like clicks on a DOM element directly, we have the unpatch directive. Um, I have not in mind if you have host listeners also unpatched from, from our directive, but we, we also ship um, not now, but next year, uh, custom event managers where you can basically detach all your events or only specific events from, from zone. And then you can deal with that. Cool. Great. So the next one is for Lemis. Um, where is it? It's, it's here. So Markus is uh, wondering if we can also compile JavaScript to WebAssembly. There is a, I mean, language is like a TypeScript and uh, assembly script that you can compile to WebAssembly. I think there are some packages which are experimental yet, open source side projects that you can check out, uh, that you can find on GitHub. I can give you the links if you want. Yeah, but uh, JavaScript to WebAssembly, nah, it's not the point. I mean, uh, yeah. 
Mm -hmm. no. Makes sense. And he is also wondering what's with TypeScript. I think you've already yeah. answered this. Yeah, yeah. There is there is an open source uh, package for TypeScript to cool. TypeScript compiler to WebAssembly. Nice, nice. And I think you have mentioned uh, Meanwhile Webpack also supports it to compile your stuff down to WebAssembly. Yeah, exactly. Nice. So one thing I am wondering is, uh, can you tell us a bit more about your use case, uh, about this algorithm you have implemented with WebAssembly? Uh, use case, I mean, in general? Yeah. Yeah, I was... What does it do? Yeah. Huh? Sorry, what, the, what does it do, this algorithm? Yeah, it was about, I mean, uh, my algorithms were just O to one, O to one algorithms, which are uh, very, I mean, um, which are not fast in JavaScript, okay? Uh, which takes so many time. And I think when it's recursive and complex, the JavaScript virtual uh, machine took so much time in order to compile, optimize, parse, and execute. Yeah, and uh, this was the, uh, I mean, uh, the explanation of my latency I detected in my in my Node.js uh, server. So um, this is what I, I mean, experimented, okay? It's those algorithms with WebAssembly and the gain is hilarious. I mean, you can find a gap between uh, the performance, uh, the execution times in WebAssembly and uh, and uh, JavaScript, okay? Maybe in others, algorithms, you can find that gain, okay? But in that particular uh, complexity, with that particular complexity, complexity you can find, uh, I mean, a, a, a significant uh, gain, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, those are the use cases I experimented, which are calculations-based functions. But there is also a significant uh, gain in uh, all the stuff, uh, I mean, low-level uh, low level stuff tools, okay, like Webpack, uh, like some processes in, um, in, in the browsers, I mean, in the code of, of, the, brow of the browsers, etc. Uh, yeah, I think that there is a significant gain there also. Yeah, and what I uh, I want to experiment also is something AI. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, in the browser. Okay, it's whether uh, some AI experience. Uh, I want to see what this will uh, will look like. I mean, yeah, uh, this is my future uh, path. You want, and uh, another thing in in Angular also, uh, there is a gain I think in web applications, and this is something I am working on now, but it's not really uh, announced. But yeah, uh, there is a gain also in web applications in general, using Wasm. Oh, cool, cool. So yeah. I guess we have a lot of stuff to talk about next time when you do yeah. it again. <laughs> Cool. Okay. So to both of you, thank you. We had really two awesome talks. Uh, Can I have a last one? Sorry, course, I was muted. Course, yeah. Excuse me. Yeah. I, I was like talking, talking, <laughs> and then I realized I'm muted. So the common problem when you're online. I have uh, I have really some 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 uh, curious questions about the limits of this compilation process to Wasm, and uh, because I'm barely informed of all the edge cases and downsides and are there any limits so what what is like the limit of this compilation execution process uh, can i use any data structure there can i use anything javascript chips what was the biggest downside you have in, in all those experiments you run yeah you look till till now i did uh, the limits i really the significant limits i can i mean i mean i can say are in um all this debugging stuff and uh, the, uh, the in the source map also of JavaScript. Okay, there are some conflicts, and uh, yeah, you can you, you can't. I mean, if there is a, a problem, okay, and uh, you you can debug. Uh, you can't have a detailed like uh, error 
or thing, okay? So it's not detailed. Neither errors nor, I mean, uh, exceptions, uh, all the stuff. So, yeah, this is a little bit tricky till now. But, uh, yeah, those are the limbs. I mean, it's not like JavaScript you can find... Uh, yeah, some details, uh, callbacks, etc., cetera, uh, and call stack. Uh, those, I think those are the significant limit till now that I noticed. Yeah, but but the community is working on this, okay? Uh, there are significant, um, yeah, uh, projects in uh, open source projects that are dealing and giving, uh, yeah, some solutions in order to work around this stuff. But yeah, this is a, a limit. Cool. Thanks. Cool, great. So once again, thank you for coming to our meetup. Also, Thanks thank you for this and have a nice evening. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks for having me. Bye. Pleasure.